Hello, this is David Rovix with a special pandemic review edition of my podcast, This Week with David Rovix. You can find This Week with David Rovix and my other podcast, Song for Today, on all the usual podcasting platforms. During the five and a half weeks between the beginning of March and my 53rd birthday on April 10th, a lot has happened. I've been musically documenting global developments a bit more actively than usual, with 11 songs written about different aspects of the pandemic. Things have been moving so fast that there is, at least for me, a desire to take a moment to take stock of where we've gone in just the past week, let alone the past five weeks. So I offer you this little retrospective a bit of a month in review. At the beginning of March 2020, I was still planning on spending most of the spring touring on three continents in nine or ten different countries. Most of the gigs were booked, but for the later parts of the tour, I was still communicating with various gig organizers all over Northern Europe about organizing more shows, as it goes with booking such tours. I left for Australia on March 4th, a couple days earlier, I had penned my first song related to the recently named COVID-19 virus, which the World Health Organization had not yet declared a pandemic. It seemed evident that it would be coming to North America from Europe, and that we, we would have other massive problems to deal with on top of the crises that pre-pandemic life was already full of. The housing crisis, opioid addiction, rife government corruption and mismanagement, threats of war against various other countries, growing fascist movements from the U.S. to Brazil to India, and on and on. Welcome to 2020, as it was taking shape. The virus is spreading, I'm under lockdown, they got a quarantine on the whole town. No face masks left from coast to coast, running out of things folks want the most. As everyone stays home and waits to find out what might be their fate. The biggest flows of refugees across the Mediterranean Sea. On the move, evermore from Honduras to El Salvador. Reactionaries on the rise, Mussolini reprise. It's 2020, the decade has just begun. With any luck, we just might make it to 2021. Reining over, rioting mobs, tired of the lack of decent jobs. Without lives, people want to live. Something, it seems, had to give. Fascists looking for someone to blame. From India to Brazil, it's the same. It's 2020. The decade's just begun. With any luck, we just might make it to 2021. Bush all burning, towns destroyed, then the flooding, filling the void, left by the loss of the plants and soil, but they keep digging for coal, drilling for oil, as if the end times weren't right here, just go shopping, do not fear, it's 2020, the decade's just begun, with any luck we just might make it to 2021. They're miniaturizing nukes again, red button subs and orange men. Resistance grows on many lines, from rebellions to election signs. Yellow vests, austerity, billionaires and Bernie. It's 2020, the decade's just begun. With any luck, we just might make it to 2021. Virus is spreading, I'm under lockdown, they got a quarantine on the whole town. I had planned to spend two weeks in Australia. I cut the Australia trip short after one week and soon cancelled all other plans. If they didn't get cancelled before me or the organizers of the gig in question had a chance to cancel it, by new executive orders in the US or Europe about gatherings of more than 20 people, before they closed all the venues altogether. While obsessively following global news developments during my week in Australia, it became very evident that whatever else was going to happen with this pandemic, getting through these times of crashing economies and quarantined cities was going to require a whole lot of mutual aid and solidarity among humans.
We clearly had an occasion to rise to. We were at a crossroads, and how things were going to look once we got to the other side was anybody's guess. There's foreboding in the air, waiting for an earthquake. Pandemic spreading, no telling how it might remake a world so divided in so many, many ways. Anyone can see it's no way to greet such days when you can shut your borders, but it'll barely slow the spread with a million people homeless and not enough hospital beds. In times like these, we find out that a society is only just as strong as our solidarity. The foreboding in the air can get only thicker As we see our leaders passing blame and getting sicker A crashing economy, leaders fraught with indecision Only capable of thinking like bought-off politicians Not enough testing kits, and the ones you got were broken But hey, the president has spoken In times like these, we find out that a society is only just as strong as our solidarity A million people wake up in the morning thinking Thoughts they never had till they found out they were sinking On a cruise ship full of holes where if you can't catch the breeze There are no fences tall enough to keep out the disease Lifting every boat or watching them all sink Ready or not, we're standing on the brink in times like these, we find out that a society is only just as strong as our solidarity. Contain an epidemic like in Wuhan or in Seoul, or watch a catastrophe take its toll. Hide behind our gates, cowering afraid, or organize our neighbors in mutual aid. In synchronicity, such great things can be done. A planet to lose, or a world to be won. In times like these, we find out that a society is only just as strong as our solidarity. In times like these, we find out that a society is only just as strong as our solidarity. Back home in Portland by March 15th, on one of the last flights into the U.S. before they were all canceled, but before there were stay-at-home orders across the country, it was becoming increasingly clear that the U.S., even under the totally incompetent and kleptocratic Trump administration, still possessed enough functionality as a state to mount some kind of belated science-based response to the pandemic, and to mount some kind of economic response that might result in capitalism not being overthrown by millions of angry, unemployed, hungry people. We were, it seemed, after all, in this together at least to whatever extent the ruling class thought necessary in order to maintain their grip on power under the circumstances. This was clearly going to be an opening for the positive transformation of many societies in the end, at least potentially. The future was and is unwritten, but people were starting to imagine what it could look like post-pandemic in a self-consciously interdependent world. I'll tell you a story, although It's one you already know It only started a few months back When a new flu virus began to attack The bodies of human beings People were shocked by what they were seeing Getting sick and moving past It was time to act and act fast the Chinese people mobilized The world watched with wide open eyes A hospital built in ten days flat In Wuhan City in the year of the rat In the year of solidarity When whatever your ideology all that remained was the simple call An injury to one is an injury to all We're in this together That's the score as with this virus And so much more from South Africa 
to Iran, from New York to Wuhan. The virus spread everywhere through the droplets in the air, contained in China, but overseas with every airplane. Each cough or sneeze, it became clear just a bit too late in the Western capitalist states. Collective action is what we need, not your mansions or your greed. Landlords and tenants, poor and rich, in the same boat, ain't that a bitch? Suddenly all the world's wealth won't protect the public health unless all the public has a patch of land where they can isolate and wash their hands. Not even the careless have to care since we're all breathing the same air. We're in this together. That's the score as with this virus and so much more from Kenya to Iran, from Venice to Wuhan. The future now is yet unwritten. What will become of these politicians who sold their stocks when they knew what the state was going to have to do? Who had to act but did so, so late? The time was now, but they'd hesitate. Patten the hatches, count your beans, and find out what exponential means in the aftermath with millions dead. Might our species come out ahead? A teachable moment, if there ever was one. The same earth, the same moon, the same sun. The same water, the same air. The same blood, the same skin, the same hair. The same feelings, the same desire. The same world underwater or on fire. We're in this together. That's the score as with this virus and so much more from Argentina to Iran, from Portland to Wuhan. I'll tell you a story, although it's one that you already know. It only started a few months back when a new flu virus began to attack. As I put together this pandemic retrospective podcast, the promised checks from the Treasury Department have not yet begun to arrive. Many people are very desperate. Others who are fortunate enough to have enough food and money for other necessities are suffering from the isolation of self-quarantine or some other form of quarantine. In hospitals, nursing homes, and especially in prisons, the suffering, the isolation, the sense of foreboding is on a whole other level of horrible. By late March, it was becoming ever more clear that after this was all over, there would be reckonings of all sorts. Many of us would have a permanently changed understanding of our emotional need for human contact and of many other things once this pandemic was over. This could be a teachable moment, though it more just looks like a mess. How long the moment might last is anyone's guess. For all of the bold propaganda, what kind of system is best? The moments like this one are the test. Where did they stay ahead of the curve? Where did they just run out of soap? Once the world shut down its borders, which countries were able to cope? Once this pandemic is over, this could be a teachable moment, the moment we find out how much it can be so hard to get through just a day when you can't touch someone that you know to hold their hands in yours. How interminable the walls, the ceilings, floors. How long a day goes on, how lonely life can be. 
how much we're all a part of a society. Once this pandemic is over, this could be a teachable moment where anyone with half a brain understands that we're all just as good as the weakest link in the chain. With exponential growth, one for all and all for one is the only way to hope to slow such a viral run. With some of us in mansions and others left in tents, while what's drifting in the air won't be kept out by a fence. Once the pandemic is over, this could be a teachable moment, though at the price of so many lives lost, to be stratified and divided. Death is the cost. After all of the funerals, after we've mourned all the dead, might we then have a world that's bound by a common thread, a thread that is sown like a virus and connects us all worldwide. Maybe then we can say there's a reason your grandparents died. Once this pandemic is over, once this pandemic is over. There were a lot of people stocking up on groceries. Exactly what people were stocking up on seemed bizarre to me. The desire to be prepared for whatever was coming made sense. Any denizen of Oregon is at least supposed to be aware that it's a good idea to be prepared for the big one, the massive earthquake that seismologists say is definitely coming at some point in the next few decades. But among the first products the supermarkets were running out of were perishables like milk and eggs, which have a fairly short shelf life, while there was never a shortage of, say, root vegetables. The anxiety around the almost complete absence from the shelves of toilet paper was a source of amusement for me and many other people who have spent time in societies where they don't use toilet paper much. I remember, growing up in the suburbs of Connecticut, believing that there was something hygienic and civilized about modern conveniences like running water and toilet paper. Much later in life, I learned that while running water is a wonderful and hygienic development, though not at all a modern one, toilet paper is not nearly as hygienic or as preferred in much of the world as a little hose of some kind that squirts, yes, water. In Japan, the toilets have a self-cleaning, computer-driven spout that comes out of its spot in the toilet bowl on the press of a button to spray your ass with a stream of water, the intensity and temperature of which you can control with other buttons right there beside you on the toilet seat. Throughout the Middle East, and, I have learned since writing the following song, also in at least some parts of Africa, every toilet has a little hose attached to the tank. A more manual version of the sophisticated Toto washlets you'll find throughout Japan, the Middle Eastern hose toilets require you to point the stream of water where you want to spray it, rather than relying on the computer. Running water is still available, even in Detroit, at least temporarily, perhaps until the crisis is over and they once again start shutting off the water and evicting the tenants who are too poor to pay for such privileges. There's a pandemic spreading, viruses are shedding, much of the world is in some kind of quarantine. Folks are panic buying, in the hospitals they're dying, and overall it is a catastrophic scene. Such a litany of probs from shortages of swabs, masks, and other essential medical supplies. But one thing that's gone missing that has everybody pissing should not determine who lives or who dies. I'm talking about toilet paper, toilet paper, a commodity that usually abounds. Toilet paper, toilet paper, what shall we do if there's none to be found? Travel for miles and miles, folks are fighting in the aisles to get their hands on another roll. Without some left to swipe, they're using paper towels and wet wipes, which are taking just a terrible toll. 
all across the nation, from homes to gas stations, water pipes and sewage systems clogging. It might be worth its weight in gold in some places where it's sold. Those loggers better step up their damn logging. Talking about toilet paper, toilet paper, a commodity that usually abounds. Toilet paper, toilet paper, what shall we do if there's none to be found? If you find you're at a loss, listen closely, boss. At least for this problem, there's a solution. As is often the case, you'll find it in a place they call the cradle of civilization. You can spray it through a hose, and if you don't have one of those, don't use your old t-shirt. Just a bottle of H2O, and you're all ready to go. Just aim and squirt. I'm talking about toilet paper, toilet paper, a commodity that usually abounds. Toilet paper, toilet paper, what shall we do if there's none to be found? COVID-19 was ravaging parts of Italy and Spain, while some politicians in the U.S., Brazil, and elsewhere were still making comparisons between the pandemic and a normal flu season as if the flu season normally requires expanding hospital capacity into army tents, using ice cream trucks for dead bodies, and running out of basic medical equipment all over the world. A study of the last global pandemic, that escaped from its origins on the front lines of World War I to devastate communities on every continent with a human population on it, shows what we're up against when facing an illness that attacks the respiratory system, to which we have no immunity, from which there is a mortality rate of at least 1%. The so-called Spanish flu, left relatively unchecked as it was in most of the world, killed at least 50 million people in the space of six months. World War was raging. Like the earth had never seen, a whole generation lined up in the trenches with killing machines. But aside from a few islands and some mountain peaks, the pandemic killed more people in just 24 weeks. No one knows where it began, speculation's gone on for years. The trenches of Europe is where the deadly strain appears. From packed trains and hospitals around the globe, it spread the war strain of the virus that left so many dead. unequal, but barely anywhere was left untouched, though the greatest share of dying was reserved for the poorest colonies of the empires and their wars that created this disease. If you have a couple hours, then do something with me, conduct a little research into your family tree. If you look into it, it won't take long, quite likely you will find in 1918 you left an ancestor behind. Pandemic knew no borders, it went from the front lines, which had increased its deadliness as if by design. It circled the whole planet, so many people died, they dug mass graves everywhere, put your relatives inside. A world war was raging, like the earth had never seen, whole generations lined up killing machines. But aside from a few islands and some mountain peaks, the pandemic killed more people in just 24 weeks. By the beginning of this month, it was becoming abundantly clear from the hospitals full of critically ill patients and morgues full of dead bodies from New York to Detroit to Chicago to New Orleans that the ranks of the sick and the dead included a vastly disproportionate number of what they call essential workers, medical staff, hospital workers, supermarket clerks, and bus drivers such as Jason Hargrove of Detroit. Essential or expendable, both words start with an E. A pandemic is spreading, the health system's collapsing, you can watch it all unfolding on the screen. If you're afraid to go outside, enough groceries to hide, it may have been weeks since you have seen. 
But someone you can touch And you miss it so much As you wonder what might happen next Like when your savings run out And the choice is all about What kind of help you might be able to expect Or perhaps when COVID arrived While some struggled to survive You were what they call essential It didn't take long To see you got that wrong The word they really meant was expendable It didn't take long to see There was no emergency Plans in place for something Which all the scientists knew Was just a matter of when There'd be a pandemic again And the kleptocrats in power Didn't have a clue Otherwise, why? Did Jason Hargrove die? Because he kept keeping on Waking before dawn To do his part for society Jason drove his bus He didn't even make a fuss At the time of the impropriety Somebody coughed The virus was off Not two weeks later Jason would be dead What if he had protective gear With sick passengers so near With no barrier to protect his head Otherwise why? Did Jason Hargrove die? Stay home, flatten the curve, they say, unless we need you to serve food for us or care for all the ill. In that case, we'll call you a hero, like the workers at Ground Zero, where one by one the cemetery filled. Now in every bus and truck, the drivers try their luck, essentially told, thank you for your service. If these were the front lines, no one put up any signs. Did anybody sign up for this? Yes, why? Did Jason Hargrove die? Once the death rate peaks, in days or months or weeks, with each one of the virus's waves. Once we can take stock and recover from the shock of the sight of all of the mass graves. Will this be the impetus, this driver on a bus, along with so many, many more? The nurses and the prisoners, seafarers and farm workers, what will they all die for? Why? Did Jason Hargrove die? Why? Did Jason Hargrove die? The fifth of the month is usually when renters will be hit with a late fee if they don't pay their monthly rent by then. By the fifth of April, it was becoming clear that a whole lot of renters in the U.S. had not paid their rent yet, like one out of four. In Portland and many other cities, some of those unable to pay, as well as some of those able to pay but who suddenly have other, more pressing priorities than supporting their landlords, especially now that evictions have been temporarily suspended by the governor, are consciously organizing their non-payment as an act of resistance, embracing the once popular form of collective action known as the rent strike. There's a suspension on eviction, so stick to your convictions and don't pay the rent. If at home we have to stay, then most of us can't pay, so don't pay the rent. Tell your landlord, sir, that mortgage can defer. Don't pay the rent. If they start rattling their sabers, say I need to feed my neighbors and don't pay the rent. It's time now to demand one big union grand. Don't pay the rent. Neoliberalism is dead. It's time to raise your head and don't pay the rent. Strike for the guarantee. A home for everybody. Don't pay the rent. Running water, housing, health care all across this earth we share. Yeah, don't pay the rent. Capitalism has failed, put the billionaires in jail. Don't pay the rent. We need a new world now, and let me tell you how. 
don't pay the rent. With mutual aid, a new world can be made. Don't pay the rent. From the ashes of the old, if we stop doing what we're told, and don't pay the rent. Solidarity with society. Don't pay the rent. Our lives matter a lot. The landlord's profits do not. Don't pay the rent. We can redefine what is theirs and ours and mine if we don't pay the rent. There's a suspension on evictions, so stick to your convictions and don't pay the rent. As the rent strike continues, people involved with property management and other aspects of the real estate business have suddenly started engaging with the media, and even engaging with me and other people putting songs up on YouTube and such, trying to reason with us and convince us that landlords play a useful role in society and we pay the rent for the greater good of everyone. I wonder why they were so disinterested in discussing such topics before there was a ban on evictions. The saddest part, though, is that their arguments are convincing to many. What is clearly the case is that we are our own biggest enemies. For as long as most of us believe there is anything remotely legitimate about a corporation making profits off of increasing the cost of rent on tenants just because they can, just because people will do anything to keep a roof over their heads, then we are the problem along with the landlords. As long as we think this model of society this cutthroat capitalist model that has so many people spending 90% of their earnings on rent is remotely acceptable, then there's no hope. As long as many of us would trade places with our landlords if we had a lot more money in the bank, we're doomed. What we desperately need, more than perhaps anything physical, actually, is imagination. The ability to imagine how society could be different. If you've ever been to, say, Europe then you don't have to try very hard. European countries have their problems, and in recent decades, things have gotten worse in many countries, not better, with what the millions of protesters I have sung for at European labor rallies call austerity budgets, and other neoliberal, that is, what we call in the U.S. free market, reforms that helped big corporations and hurt the working class. But European capitalism is still a very different model of capitalism than the U.S., with very different basic assumptions made by even the most conservative governments about things like the rights of citizens to things like some form of more or less universal access to housing, health care, and education. It's at moments like these, everything is in the air. The possibilities are nowhere and everywhere. You gotta break a bone to set it, and now all we are is broke, a lot of folks are saying. It's time to be woke. And they're not talking about microaggressions, but the really big ones. The basic assumptions, like planets circling suns, but there are no natural laws that built your mansions or your tents. These are creations of society, just like mortgages and rent. It's a future of uncertainty. But our liberation can only be as free as our imagination. If you were born and raised to believe it's sacrosanct, that whoever has a whole lot of money in the bank deserves to then live off the wealth from the houses that they own, and if they raise your rent you can move or take out a loan, then how can you demand your human rights? If you don't believe you have any, as if you deserve your plight. But if things were hard before, now the system has flatlined. Time for those basic rights to be redefined. It's a future of uncertainty. But our liberation 
can only be as free as our imagination. All these vaunted freedoms added to the Constitution as an afterthought after Shays Rebellion did not include the right to land or the right to eat or the right for human beings not to be dying on the street. It's moments like these when we're standing on the edge that we might catch the strongest breeze to land furthest from the ledge because we can fly, you know. All you need is wings. We can house and feed each other. Together we could do anything. It's a future of uncertainty, but our liberation can only be as free as our imagination. It's at moments like these everything is in the air. The possibilities are nowhere and everywhere. Although our experiences vary wildly depending on one's situation in life, whether your profession allows you to telecommute, whether you have any savings or just a maxed out credit card, whether you live alone in a spacious house with a hot tub in the backyard or in a crowded apartment with ten members of your extended family, unless we are working in a hospital or certain other locations, though, the experience for many of us is one of a very slow-moving, very surreal, very big national and global catastrophe. The sun shines, the grass waves in the breeze, the dogs run on the field next door, and the news is full of death and suffering, as I sit at my desk, looking out the window, writing a song about my experience of turning 53 in quarantine on April 10th, 2020. I turned 53 in quarantine, the sun is shining, the field's green, the air's so fresh. Like the countryside, streets are empty, open wide. It's all so quiet, save for the leaves, waving gently in the breeze. And a couple of kids in their usual spot, scooting in circles round the parking lot. I turn 53 in quarantine, slowest birthday ever seen. Clouds are drifting in the sky The occasional jogger jogging by Usually with headphones on Eyes fixed low Leaving a wide berth as they go If they wanted to talk They might not dare Lest some drops of spit float in the air I turn 53 in quarantine I wouldn't normally have a big party scene. I'd be going on tour though, in the typical spring, playing shows and everything. Seeing friends crossing borders, finding trouble, not hiding with my family in a sealed bubble, waiting till the time comes when we can be part of the world of other people. Again, I turned 53 in quarantine. Watching the world lose its sheen As things all rust and fall apart No more horse to pull the cart No couriers out, they went on strike That's what desperate times are like Figures cuz we joined in too It's been five weeks since the rent was due I turned 53 in quarantine, strangest birthday I ever seen. As I put this podcast together on Sunday, April 12th, it is tomorrow, starting on the week of April 13th, that the federal authorities say the direct deposits to anyone on the tax rolls will begin. The actual physical checks in the mail will take much longer and there are many people out there who aren't set up for direct deposit with the IRS or who haven't filed taxes in years or ever because they never made enough money to bother. The tension in the air gets ever thicker by the day. There will be many, many people checking their bank account balances every hour or so every day of the next week, I suspect. 
We have a checking account with a major bank for some reason, Wells Fargo. Their website has been down for the past two days. Maybe it's a coincidence. The world shut down last month. They said go work from your home office. And if you're a doctor or a checkout clerk, thank you for your service. But for most everybody else, out of work and unessential. They're looking at the mailbox for something consequential. Waiting for their checks to come. Each time I leave the apartment, the scene is a bit grimmer. The faces look more desperate, the margins getting slimmer. More people at the bus stop, who knows where they're heading, searching for something to grab onto as they try to keep on treading, waiting for their checks to come. A herd of deer are roaming through the center of the town. Pretty soon the hunters might show up, start mowing them down. More folks thinking how they might get what they need. More and more talk of changing this system based on wealth and greed, waiting for their checks to come. The buds are blooming on the trees. Spring is in the air. It seems like such a mismatch with this tension everywhere. You can cut it with a knife. You can shoot it with a gun. At least if you bought ammunition before there was a run. Waiting for their checks to come. Waiting for their checks to come. Waiting for their checks to come. This has been a 2020 Pandemic Review and a special edition of This Week with David Rovix, an intermittent podcast you can subscribe to on Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, and all the other usual platforms, along with my other more frequent podcast, Song for Today. You can also find these podcasts on the David Rovix mobile app, front and center at davidrovix.com, and by listening to the Folk Music Notebook internet radio station. You'll find all my COVID-19 related songs at davidrovix.com slash quarantine, as well as information about things I'm doing during the crisis, such as live streamed broadcasts every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. If you want to support my work in these days of closed borders and canceled tours, go to davidrovix.com slash subscribe or patreon.com slash davidrovix. Hope to see you here in the Matrix and in the not-too-distant future in the streets and cafes of the world.